Did you know that you're God's workmanship recreated in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has already predestined and ordained for you so that you can walk in them? Oh, such good news. Let's get going here. Precious Heavenly Father, we have been recreated in Christ Jesus, and we believe we receive your help right now to meditate on your word, to know your word. Holy Spirit, do the work of getting the, the clutter out of the way and getting the seed of your word into our hearts. We receive that help right now. Jesus has you on assignment so that we can live life strong in his name. Amen. Ultimate Living Part 2. Ultimate Living Part 2. And this one is really going to focus in on customized living. Ultimate Living is customized living. Part 2. So in review, let's remember that ultimate means the best or the most extreme of its kind. That's what we learned. It's to the most. We've learned at the very beginning of this series that the world doesn't have a clue what ultimate living really is. We drop 3 John 2, remember that verse, and realize that God doesn't serve life in just fractions and portions of broken pieces. He's the God who makes all the ingredients of life and living correlate. Not constipate, but correlate. And of course, we learn that ultimate living needs to ventilate. It needs to cycle. Ultimate living is ultimate giving. Now, you might be saying right now, well, Stephen, now, who made you this expert in this area? Well, what makes you such an authority on ultimate living? Ah, you ask good questions. Well, you're on it. I love it. If someone were to talk on restoring vintage cars, they actually should have done the work, right? And restored several amazing collector's edition classic muscle cars, right? Well, I'm going to ask you to permit me to defer to Paul the Apostle and what he said on that subject. Philippians 3 verse 12, it says this, It's not that I have already reached this goal, or have already been perfected, I'm going to put in brackets there, in ultimate living, but I pursue it so that I may grab hold of it, ultimate living, because Christ grabbed hold of me for just this purpose, the purpose of ultimate living. What purpose? For the purpose of ultimate living, my friend. Jesus gave us his life for this purpose, for this reason. Look around you right now. The world's in trouble. People are struggling. There's uncertainty. There's fear. People in general are longing for more than just another political promise. They want real life answers. It's not an accident that Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said about himself. The way where? To ultimate living. The truth to what? Ultimate living. The life, the life of what? Ultimate living. Ultimate living life. That's what? It's the purpose you were made for, but everything is relative, my friend, everything. Yes, ultimate living is relative. It's customized for you. Okay, Stephen, please tell me how so, how so? Well, in 1 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul talks about the variety and the diversity in the members of the body of Christ. He amplifies the metaphor actually comparing it to a human body by asking us to imagine one member as a foot, another as a hand, another as an eye, an ear. You kind of get in the picture, another as a nose. And as the Bible explains, we are many members, but different parts of one body, united in Christ. So here's the point that I want you to understand about ultimate living being relative. Ultimate living is only in Christ. There is forgiveness and no other. There is abundant life and no other. He is the source of salvation, healing, restoration, eternal life, love, grace, and on and on and on. So once you and I are engrafted or adopted into the family of God, which is called the body of Christ, imagine if you were an I, would you want to receive the same thing as what the foot would consider ultimate living? Right, right? Let, let me just show you here, just to get this in your heart here. W would you want the, my foot enjoys my boot, but would would your eye, like, well, I'm part of the body of Christ too, so give me, how come I don't get a boot? 
How come I don't get a boot in the eye, right? So, like, or can you imagine if the hand called out for ultimate living? The hand said, you know, I got this beautiful glove. And let me grab a glove here just a second. I got this glove. And the, and the eye's like, well, if the hand gets a glove, what, how come I don't get a glove? Where's my glove? Are you starting to get the picture here? Ultimate living, what we're talking about and trying to get the same thing for everything, that's spiritual socialism. One size fits all. It's a one tired, used up religion for everybody. That's not what God's got for you. He's got a customized fit just for you, for the purposes of your life. Jesus knows you and calls you by name, your specific identity, not even your purpose. Even though he's got that plan for you, he calls you by your identity. God doesn't reward you or meet your needs according to the collective or by the standards of the crowd or the community. He knows you as an individual. God tailors, customizes his blessings for who you are. You all know Jack Black. Jack Black, the, the actor, um, funny guy, been in a lot of movies. He once said this. He said, you must never underestimate the power of the eyebrow. <laughs> See, there's a guy that knows diversity, right? The world teaches envy and coveting, wanting what someone else has and what they think will make you happy. To envy what someone else has tells me that you don't have a grip on your true identity. You don't really know who you are to want what somebody else has. An eye coveting a boot? Are you kidding me? Right? Christians in God's family participate in the rebellion of envy and coveting, even jealousy, believing the lie that God cannot satisfy their longing, tailor to their longing and their desire, what it is that they really want and desire and that matters to them. See, that's not living, let alone ultimate living. Billy Graham said this. He said, envy and greed starve on a steady diet of thanksgiving. So what comes first, ultimate living or thanksgiving? I don't believe there is such a thing as ultimate living without thanksgiving because thanksgiving is the ultimate of recognition. The eye says, I want new shoes like the feet have. What about me, right? Ultimate living is activated by faith. Envy is not faith. Jealousy is definitely not faith. Wanting something that you don't have is not faith. But it does help us understand where you're at. You have a case of desire without knowledge. That's what Proverbs 19 verse 2 says. You don't know who he is and what he can do. I see people desperate for life, grasping at accumulation. Well, it, well, if I just had a bigger house or a, another car, or if I just had more money, I just need more money, another child. If we could just have another child, a better spouse, I need a better spouse, more attention, a better feeling, and the list goes on and on and on. But still, no living, no ultimate living, that's for sure, no identity. Ultimate living is knowledge of who you are and who made you, trusting in him. Ultimate living is relative because it's tailored to you. It's a custom fit for you. Now look, Pam and I are both Christians. We both love Jesus. We love each other. We have a lot of places where our desires, they intersect. We both love reading the Word of God together. We really enjoy that. We like eating healthy food. We like horseback riding in the open pastures of Wyoming. We love songwriting together, making music. But there are places where our interests and our desires, they do not intersect. For example, Pam, listen, Pam likes these girl shops with girl things like makeup and stuff, you know? Sephora, things like that. I don't, no, no, sir, I do not like that stuff. Now, Pam's amazing at water skiing, and therefore she loves to be on the lake behind a boat. It's not me. I'm just not good at it, so I just don't really like it. I laugh at physical and slapstick humor. 
That really makes me laugh for some reason. I don't know what's wrong with me, but it makes me laugh. Pam, she tolerates it for my sake. A lot of times we'll be sitting on the couch and I'll be laughing and I'll look it over her and she's like stone faced and she'll be like, <laughs> that's what she'll do. So if you were to put an electric guitar in Pam's hands and drop me off in the makeup store, we would not feel like we were engaged in ultimate living at all, unless reverse it and I was buying her makeup and she was getting me an electric guitar. By the way, Pam did buy me this amazing, custom, beautiful electric guitar a few years ago. Beautiful. You see, the cycle of ultimate living occurs at the point you learn ultimate giving. Pam had this lifelong dream to swim with the dolphins. Since she was just a little girl, that was her dream to just swim with the dolphins. Well, a couple of years ago, after a very difficult time in which Pam's hero dad passed away, I came up with this plan to make her swim with the dolphins dream come true. Now, it wasn't a convenient time. In fact, it was a very challenging time for me. Plus, it was in the middle of the summer and we had to fly into one of the most humid, hot places in North America to surprise, to fulfill the surprise for Pam, this big, wonderful childhood dream surprise for Pam. I loathe humidity. If you know me, you know I loathe humidity. My hair, my hair loathes humidity. I am not a hot weather person. It's not my fit, but but because of love, because God has revealed to me the secret to ultimate living, I've learned that even when I'm uncomfortable, giving is living. It's ultimate living. If you could have seen the tears in Pam's eyes when that first dolphin swam up to her, oh, it was utterly amazing. Look, what doesn't fit me fits someone else. And I can, as part of God's family, I can make that happen for them. I can help them. I can help someone else's dreams come true. And so I get to engage in ultimate living. Why? Because ultimate living is in the power of ultimate giving. Ultimate living is relative. Not everything is meant to be directly for me but it may be in my power to give to someone else and therefore a perfect, necessary part of my joy, my fulfillment, my breathing in and out. Not everything is my fit, but I engage in the laws of ultimate living when I'm truly giving. The problem with not realizing everything isn't your fit is some people become highly critical and sarcastic of what doesn't fit them. Then you disqualify yourself from the power of giving. When that first dolphin swam up to Pam and she got those big tears in her eyes, looks, I, I didn't feel the humidity at all. The burning sun wasn't an issue at all. A sense of, oh, I wish I was someplace else or someplace nicer. No, 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 a thousand times no. I was exactly where I wanted to be, where ultimate living was happening in the motion of ultimate giving. It was a dream for me. I want you to understand this. Your perception works for you or it works against you. Many people train their eyes to see the negative, the bad, what they don't have. Unthankful people have a negative perception and so they never experience ultimate living. What you fail to celebrate, recognize. It will move away from you. It will leave your life. Think of parents, parents who have failed to recognize the worth or the value of their children. Oh, they may love them, but just like many people who love God, but fail to communicate that recognition, you eventually lose all access to that relationship. Do you see what you truly have? Perception. Do you perceive it? How do you communicate what you see, what you have? What's your response? Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 6, verses 22 to 23. He said, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that 
darkness. Now, let me explain something to you. This is from a Jewish custom of exercising a generous perception toward a need. That's what the eye means. It's your perception. Someone might go to door to door on behalf of a need in the community saying, please have a good eye toward the widow Smith. She has a need. That means please be generous and not stingy or selfish in your perception toward the widow. Do you have a good eye or a bad eye, a good perception or a bad perception? Do you have a glass is half full or a glass is half empty perception of life? Jesus said, if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Greed affects your physical body because it's spiritual darkness. It's the opposite of a healthy focus. Your perception is your reality. So ask yourself, is my perception good or is my perception bad? What you perceive ends up being what you receive. Now, that may worry you, but I've got good news, my friend. Jesus came to fix, to heal all of our perceptions. Jesus has come to fix our perception. How? He convicts us of wrong thinking. That's a good thing to be convicted of your thinking. He converts sterile greed into fruitful seed. That's what Jesus does. But we have got to take advantage of his conviction and his correction. There's this dangerous substitution for correction in our culture right now, and it's called confirmation. I want to be very gentle right now. Because in the next few minutes, I believe God's Holy Spirit is going to do something powerful, but very complicated, more difficult than the most challenging neurosurgery. We've all had that desire, even a craving, to be right, to be confirmed. The appetite for confirmation is insatiable. The patient longs to be right. You feel there's no other option. I have to be right. Therefore, the only fix, the only antidote is the panacea, you guessed it, confirmation. And the enemy knows this, you see. The information portals of media and industry count on your craving for confirmation. Here's the problem, though, with confirmation. It will never, ever give you the true ultimate life, the true ultimate living experience. Why, you ask? Because confirmation is not a substitute for God's correction. And without correction, God's correction, you will never, ever truly feel like you belong. Never, never. Look at Hebrews 12, verses 7 and 8. You must submit to and endure correction for discipline. God is dealing with you as sons, sons and daughters. For what son is there whom his father does not thus train and correct and discipline? Now, if you are exempt from correction, let me say that again, look at that. Now, if you're exempt from correction and left without discipline in which all of God's children share, then you are illegitimate offspring and not true sons and daughters at all. Would you correct or fix or repair something that you think is worthless? No, you just toss it. When a person falls for the trap of confirmation bias and turns from God's correction, guess what's happening? They become hopeless, scared, even angry, pursuing more information that might support their confirmation bias. I've seen it a thousand times over. Are you struggling with fear right now? Do you feel hopeless right now? When was the last time you heard God say, you're going the wrong way? Stop doing that. When was the last time you heard God say that? When parents lovingly correct a child, it's to help them arrive at obedience, respect, attention, sharing, love, blessing. They want blessing for their kid. Correction is evidence of direction. It's evidence that you've got direction to ultimate living. Now, don't be discouraged or feel condemned if you've been a confirmation chaser, but repent. Let God love you. Jesus confirmed your worth at the cross. Now let his thinking discipline you for ultimate living. Let's take a look at Jesus' thinking on full display in this stewardship story. 
It's stewardship. It's all about ultimate living. Look at this, Matthew 25, starting at verse 14. For it is just like a man who was about to take a journey and he called his servants together and entrusted them with his possessions. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his ability, and then he went on his journey. The one who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made a profit and gained five more. He doubled. Likewise, the one who had two made a profit and he gained two more. He doubled. But then the one who had received the one went and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Verse 19. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. And the one who had received the five talents and came and brought them five more, saying, Master, you entrusted me the five talents. See, I've made five more. Doubled it. 21. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful and trustworthy over a little. I'll put you in charge of many things. Share in the joy of your master. Also, the one who had two talents came forward saying, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I've made a profit and gained two more talents. His master said to him the same thing. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful and trustworthy over a little. I will put you in charge of many things and share in the joy of your master. But then the one who had received the one talent also came forward and said, Master, I knew you to be a harsh, demanding man, reaping the harvest where you did not sow, gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was was afraid to lose the talent and I went and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is your own. But his master answered him, you wicked, lazy servant. You knew I reap where I did not sow, gather where I did not scatter seed. Then you ought to have put my money with the bankers. And at my return, I would have received my money back with interest. So take the talent away from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has and values his blessings and gifts from God and has used them wisely, more will be given and he will be richly supplied so that he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, look at this, from the one who does not have, even what he does have will be taken away. Throw out the worthless servant into outer darkness in the place of grief and torment. There will be weeping and sorrow and pain and grinding of teeth over distress and anger. What? Imagine Jesus basically just said to the guy who returned the one and didn't invest it. He said to him that has nothing, even what he does have will be taken away. Vote for me, Jesus. <laughs> Can you imagine that pl platform in politics? Oh my goodness. So what did we just learn from King Jesus? Number one, all you possess is God's. You see, all we possess is God's, but he's entrusted it to you. He's testing your faithfulness so he can reward your faithfulness and put you over much. He wants to take the little you have and put you over much. Increase is always God's plan. Number two, we learn that we don't get the same thing, but according to our ability. Isn't that what the proverb said? Isn't that what he, the story he told said? Each he gave according to their ability. By the way, is again, something God has entrusted to you. It's divine design, not your making. It's what God gives you. Number three, you're assigned to profit. All of us are assigned to profit. With all God entrusts you, that means multiply, succeed. And yes, God does measure and keep an account, the books, so to speak. Number four, what else did we learn? We learned faithfulness is rewarded. There's great joy to those who are faithful and trustworthy. Number five, we learn that God inspects how you manage the little and can reassign you to much more. Good stewardship leads to expansion. Bad stewardship to contraction, loss. A loss of stewardship is proof of unfaithfulness, your disrespect for the little. But my friend, this is a new day, don't quit. You can repent. You can turn this around. And number six, we learn that ultimate living is sharing in the joy of the Lord. There's no substitute for that. John 15, 11, when you get a chance, look at that. There's no substitute for the joy of the Lord. Number seven, we learn that unfaithful and unprofitable give excuses. 
Fear and inactivity is not an excuse, my friend. It's not an option. It's not an excuse. You lose what you have. Ignoring, disregarding, hiding your blessings and gifts disqualify you from rewards, from influence, and from joy. And then number eight, we learn that disregard for sowing and reaping, it's deadly. It's consequential. Jesus used the words wicked and lazy, meaning no regard for God. Who is the owner of everything that you've been entrusted with? God, God Almighty. We cannot disregard the law of sowing and reaping. I said it at the start of ultimate living. It's relative. Therefore, ultimate giving is relative. God doesn't give everybody the same thing or even the same blessings because all of his children are unique. You're unique in his divine design. Look through Jesus' eyes at this giving episode in Luke 21, verses 1 to 4. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, Jesus said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. You see, the poor widow's legacy is still alive 2,000 years later. She captured God's attention. Talk about ultimate living being relative. Talk about ultimate giving being relative. God sees you. God saw my mom, my dear mom, reach into her purse and pull out of her great need those dollar bills. Those I remember watching her pull out those bills and put them in the ministry. It touched God's heart. I would watch her give out of her need and invest her money into the preaching of the gospel of Jesus. Are you his unique design? Yes, you are. You are his unique design. Therefore, he customizes ultimate living just for you. God gives an athlete a field to run in. God gives a musician 12 notes to play a million songs. God gives an artist color and a world of inspiration. A doctor gets a patient to help and to heal. God gives a farmer land to sow and pilots get air to fly on. Inventors get problems to solve. No one is excluded from this principle of stewardship. God has given you much, my friend. If you're alive, it's because he gives your heart another beat, your lungs another air cycle. If you work a job, it's because God blesses the neurons in your brain for cognitive process. If you can talk, it's because of God's grace. Therefore, use your words for life. Do you see how stewardship works? You can have much and either steward well by how you give or be wicked, mean, greedy, and how you misuse all the blessings and the gifts that God has given you. Jesus asks, is your lamp light or dark, generous or atrophying into a slow death? Ultimate living is relative, relative to who you are because who you are is high priority to God the Father. We all have different abilities, talents, backgrounds, resources, but where we meet is that narrow road of need that leads to Jesus. We all need Jesus for ultimate living. We all need that new identity that comes from being reborn, born again, regenerated. The only way that you can be born again is completely relative, relative to Jesus' death and resurrection. Romans 6 verse 4 says, We were buried therefore with him by the baptism into death. He's the true source of life, forgiveness, mercy, grace, healing. But how will you steward what he gives you? For to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have will be taken away. Ultimate living is in the giving. God practices this principle himself. God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. He wanted a family, so he sowed his perfect son, Jesus. How do you respond to God's best gift, his free gift? By giving him your life. Isn't that just amazing? You get to trade dirt for gold, illegitimacy for legitimacy. You and I get to trade the slavery of sin for royalty. We trade shame for glory, death for life. Even in receiving the most amazing gift in all of eternity, you are required to give what you have. 
who you are. You have to surrender your existence, your broken, needy, sinful life for Jesus' life. Just give it away. Do you want God's ultimate living? Let's pray and surrender your pain, shame, your sinful past to the redeeming King of Kings. God, I need you. Pray that, just say, God, I need you. My life is broken and I need a savior. I believe Jesus is your only begotten son. He died on a cross for me. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. On the third day, you raised him up from death. He's the king of kings. He has power to save me and set me free. Forgive me of all my sins. I give you my life. You give me ultimate living. Through Jesus giving, I'm born again. In Jesus' name. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's Word is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen. He sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. Remember, Jesus is Lord, and in Him, we can live life strong.